may also be the same for a reading test or a language test. Sometimes the scores are 85 to 115 for average. Um, now that puts you at the 15th percentile to the 85th percentile. So I think this gives you a better, most people are falling, most average people fall in this range. And okay, so we'll just go ahead and talk about the, the IQ test and I'll show you how uh, and again, it's not that I mean to dwell so much on IQ, but that's often a part of, a, uh, of an assessment, and it's an important component. Uh, just to give you, not to just come up with an IQ, like I said, I kind of got over that. So I focus more on the, the patterns of scores. And this particular test has four factor scores, which means there's four broad areas that it's measuring. It does, by the way, an IQ test doesn't measure everything, and it's not everything about a person, it's just kind of a pretty good predictor of how you might uh, perform in school. A pretty good predictor. But it, it's not measuring, you know, athletic ability, musical ability, interpersonal skills, <coughs> um, you know, um, enthusiasm for learning. It's not measuring a lot of things. So you can, so kids can have kind of low average IQs and still do great in college just because they have extreme drive that these tests don't measure. Um, so, so the one, so the first area that the test measures is verbal mouth, verbal comprehension, and that's the broad term, and it's measuring, you know, just how well you can use verbal skills in new situations, and <coughs> the scores are a reflection of education at home. So you can see an IQ isn't just an innate raw <coughs> ability; it's partly about what you've been exposed to. So from if you, you know, from the time you were a baby, if you were read to and had lots of good toys and were taken places and traveled, and that's that's much different exposure, a much different uh, experience than someone who is more deprived. So you are probably likely more likely to pick up a lot of good language abilities. At the same time, it's also measuring your ability to benefit from that exposure too. So it's kind of measuring two things, environment and how well you benefit from it. Because you can still have that same kind of enriched environment and still not pick up things as well because of some difficulties with learning language. So here are the areas that are measured. And you can see you have to you know, explain the meanings of words and you're asked factual questions on information and um, on similarities, this is an abstract task. You ask someone, how are these two things alike? And the idea is you're trying to measure uh, if they can come up with an overall idea. And in comprehension, you ask questions, well, what's the right thing to do in this situation? Or why would you want certain laws like this? And so <clears throat> getting back to your question about uh, you know, looking, analyzing the information. And here's the implications <coughs> in the classroom, you know, just being able to answer questions and uh, comprehend spoken language and uh, just pick up knowledge and express ideas verbally in written form. So if someone had very low scores on that section, then they would probably need more visual information. You know, whenever you're giving a lecture, they probably need to see what you're talking about, or to demonstrate what you mean by, you know, a science concept. Uh, and they also may need to have, you know, vocabulary development. Uh, and they need to review vocabulary terms before they read a chapter. And so there's lots of language-based things they need to be exposed to before, in order to help them compensate. And I have to say, having weaknesses in the verbal area is a bigger deal than you know some of the other areas just because you have to listen and read and speak and write every day so if you have language weaknesses then it's going to impact you know comprehending lectures and comprehending textbooks and getting that what you mean by certain directions and new con new verbal concepts so it makes learning a lot harder if you've got language weaknesses Okay, then another area is working memory. That's a second broad area. 
my working memory. Some of it's just rote memory that is measured, but the tasks also measure working <coughs> memory where you have to hold it mentally for a short period of time and then do something with it and problem solve with it. So it'd be like if you if you were trying to, to solve a story <coughs> problem and you and you have to do two or three things, are you able to stop, do that one thing, and then continue on solving the problem, or do you have to start back all over because you, you forgot where you were? Or even comprehending as you read, are you picking up enough information that it continues to make sense by the time you get to the bottom of the page? So working memory, of course, would be important too for getting directions in the classroom. And, and often kids who have ADHD have major league problems with working memory. And there's also a task where they just have to do arithmetic problems mentally and um, without, um, without pencil and paper. So you have to hold it in your mind. Okay? Do you know if that improves once they are on stimulant meds? Stimulant meds often help with that. With the working memory? Yeah. I mean, just because all of a sudden, you're, it helps you lock in. And so sometimes the working memory is just secondary to ADHD. And, the, and taking a standard <coughs> medication will help you. Because you're locked in and, and you can focus, then you, you're not, you know, it's not like you're putting your hands over their ears every minute, you know. So, yeah, it does, I think it does help some. And so, yeah, here's the things that could happen, you know, difficulty with directions and retaining information. You know, retaining information long enough to get some of it in long-term memory. And so, um, <clears throat> just memorizing factual things and taking notes, especially if there's no, no overhead, you just have to take <coughs> notes from someone. Speaking. So, it can have a pretty big impact, but it, I think these things can be pretty easily uh, accommodated for, for kids. And then you can give them photocopies of notes and have them seated up here and have a signal between yourself and the kid when they, they're starting to get off task so that nobody else knows, but you know, and the kid knows that, oh, that means, oh yeah, I better pay attention. And checking with the kid to see if they're making progress. So I think some of these weaknesses, and just give them, you know, just give them notes and I mean, you still want them to try to take notes, but give them copies of notes and um, also teaching them memory strategies, letting them know that this memory is a problem for you, so it means you have to learn to review information more often and go over it, overlearn, sort of overlearn material just to help make up for some memory weaknesses. So I just think these can be more easily uh, accommodated for. Okay, and then you have perceptual reasoning. That's the third section. And it's just about, it's measuring skills that uh, <clears throat> indicate how well you can interpret visual information and understand things spatially, which is certainly related to mathematics and science concepts. And so what you have to do is you, you know, the task you actually have to do, you have to create designs with blocks and you have to look at a matrix and figure out what the missing piece is. Or you look at pictures and choose the pictures that have something in common. It starts out real concrete and then it gets more and more abstract and more tricky. And so usually when you have uh, some weaknesses in those areas, this is how it can, how it can impact you probably heard the term nonverbal learning disability or nonverbal learning disorder. That's usually kids who have problems partly with <coughs> visual, spatial, and visual processing. Is it, is it called also dyscalculia <coughs> or dyscalculia? Well, no, I hear that. I hear, the way I hear that term, it often means problems with learning math and understanding mathematics. <coughs> That's one way I've. Uh, whoa. Need some water over here? Or? Okay. Well, anyway, that's that's where I hear the term. Yeah. Um, in difficulties with um, math um, calculation quickness, 
especially what you find on time tests. Is that usually something that is a result of working memory problems, difficulty in, in um, remembering step one of the math problem in order to proceed to step two and do it quickly enough to get through a time test? Or is it a perceptual reasoning issue um, in terms of being able to visualize how math concepts connect to each other? Or I, does it just depend? I think it would depend, but I think often it's like, it's like a slower rate of processing and a slower retrieval. Mm -hmm. What's called retrieval fluid.